Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Military Murder. I am your host, Marco, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans, because no amount of camouflage can conceal these twisted murder stories, and I am here to tell you all about them. This episode was chosen by my executive producer, Falcon 13. She joined the fan club from the jump, and the snazzy part about joining the fan club at the officially retired level is that you get your choice case, and this is Falcon 13's first pick. Today, I will cover my first military family annihilator. A family annihilator is a person who kills their entire family, but doesn't kill themselves. You may have heard of the recent infamous family annihilator, Chris Watts from Colorado, who killed his pregnant wife and their two young daughters. Well, today's story is equally disturbing, if not more. Join me today as I tell you about Air Force Technical Sergeant Edward Zakzuski II. Now, let's dig in. My sources for today's episode include two Florida Supreme Court opinions and their related filings, the Miami Herald and the Honolulu Advertiser. In the 80s, Edward Zakzuski of Kalamazoo, Michigan, found himself lost. His childhood wasn't the greatest and his parents divorced when he was 14 years old. He dabbled in drugs, including marijuana and LSD, and he tried his hand at college, but boy, was that hard. So he dropped out. Then he joined the Air Force, his first assignment being Nordstrom Air Force Base in Idaho. And the military structure seemed to suit him well. In the mid 80s, he met a South Korean woman by the name of Sylvia. Sylvia had recently divorced from her military husband. And when Edward caught her eyes, he thought that she was the world. He thought she was an angel. He instantly fell for her as she was waitressing. They quickly began dating and soon Sylvia was pregnant. She told Edward and he was like, yeah, but I'm going to be relocating to Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. Sylvia told Edward that if he left, she would get rid of the baby. So Edward decided to marry Sylvia. They moved from Idaho to Florida and the young couple was struggling because they didn't have a lot of money. But things seemed to change in 1989 when Edward got orders to South Korea. Sylvia was thrilled to return to her native country. And when she did, her family seemed to really like Edward. By the way, they were not fond of her first American military husband. Anyway, the entire time that they were stationed in Korea, life seemed great. Sylvia gave birth to their son, Edward. And two years later, she gave birth to their daughter, Anna. But all good assignments must come to an end. And in 1992, three years after arriving in South Korea, they were assigned to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. According to the Miami Herald, Edward was responsible for supervising building maintenance and supplies for the Air Force War Center at Eglin. Sylvia was pissed to move to Florida. By this point, she not only had her four-year-old son, but she also had her two-year-old daughter. Back in America, Sylvia became depressed and she really missed home. According to Edward, she ran up the phone bill to anywhere between $150 and $600 a month. Sylvia tried to make the best of the situation, but she did so by placing unrealistic goals on her husband. She wanted him to go to college, then she wanted him to go to law school, and then she wanted him to become an ambassador to South Korea so they could go back to her home country. Now, Edward, the college dropout, was like, okay, I can do that. And it seemed that he just played along. In fact, he attended school at least three nights a week, and by 1994, he had completed his junior year of college, and he'd finally gotten to the point where he made the dean's list. So now it's 1994, and 28-year-old Edward was a technical sergeant in the United States Air Force. By this time, the children were seven and five, and the Zach family appeared to have the perfect life. They had a lovely house, two kids, a boy and a girl. And well, without digging any deeper, it seemed great from the outside. In April of 1994, they even purchased a $46,000 home. But sadly, the house debt only made them more financially strained. 
and the marriage was quickly deteriorating and it wouldn't be long before Sylvia finally pulled the plug on the draining marriage. Mind you, she had been threatening divorce as far back since their time in South Korea. In early June of 94, Sylvia and Edward argued a lot and she threatened divorce many times over. She also threatened to take the kids and return to South Korea. But Edward, you know, he really didn't think it was true. He thought it would all blow over soon. But Sylvia had made plans to seriously ask Edward for a divorce. And according to Edward, she often used the children as her messenger. And on June 9th, seven-year-old Edward called his dad at work and confided in him that mom wanted a divorce. Big Edward heard the information and inside he went berserk, but he likely told the little boy not to worry. And then the call ended. During Edward's lunch break, he waltzed on into the base exchange and purchased a machete, you know, a common lunchtime purchase. And then he returned to work. After work, he went to a college class that he was attending. And when it let out about 6 p.m., he and one of his classmates hung around drinking a beer. The classmate was a Desert Storm veteran and Edward asked the guy what it was like to kill someone. They chit-chatted some more and the guy, I guess, didn't really think anything of it. And then Edward returned to his home and Mary Esther, he parked outside the home and he grabbed his machete. He walked inside the home and seeing no one there, he continued deep into the house. His first stop was the bathroom. A little later, Sylvia arrived home with the kiddos and one by one, they entered the home. And I'm assuming that they greeted Edward with, hi, dad, daddy, you know, the drill. Edward went into his bedroom where he laid in wait for Sylvia. When she failed to go in, he went looking for her and he found her. She was sitting on the couch alone with her eyes closed and resting. Edward then took her by surprise and he smashed her head with a crowbar, causing her to lose consciousness. Now, I'm assuming that it was such an ambush that Sylvia didn't even know what hit her, nor did she have an opportunity to scream. So Edward grabbed Sylvia and dragged her into their bedroom. He knew she wasn't dead, so he hit her again over the head. And then he put a rope around her neck and pulled and pulled and pulled until he knew she was dead, or at least he thought she was dead. Edward then knew what he had to do next. I imagine that Edward cheerfully called seven-year-old Edward to come and brush his teeth. We all know that youngins hate getting their teeth brushed. So I can only imagine little Edward stomping his feet when he walked into the bathroom, grabbed the toothbrush and began brushing. Just then through the bathroom mirror, little Edward saw his dad raise the machete and come straight at him. In that moment, little Edward knew what was happening. His father was attacking him. So he raised his arm in a defensive stance, attempting to protect his face, only to be slashed on his arm. But big Edward had no remorse as he hacked at his son with the machete, slicing his head, his neck and back, and ultimately stealing the young boy's life right there in the family bathroom. Little Edward died from a skull fracture and the blows to his neck. Edward then put his little son into the bathtub. It's unclear if Anna heard anything, but soon after Edward was done with his boy, he called Anna into the bathroom. Edward quickly struck five-year-old Anna with the machete, causing her little body to drape over the bathtub. It's unclear if she saw the horror that was in there because her brother was laying in there dead or if she was unconscious, but it didn't matter because Edward was not yet done with the girl. As her body was draped over the bathtub, Edward hacked and hacked at little Anna, her little body bearing signs of defensive wounds. But ultimately, she was far too little to get away from the attacks. And when Edward was done, he stacked little Anna over her brother. He quickly returned to the bedroom to see about Sylvia. Now that he had the entire house to himself, he dragged Sylvia from the bedroom into the bathtub and not 100% sure she was dead, he then hacked at her with the machete, ensuring almost certain death. Then he stacked Sylvia in the bathtub over her two dead children. The bathroom, now a scene from a horror movie. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins. 
which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress, and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like, and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, and it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. After he was done, Edward went into the kitchen, grabbed a few beers, turned on some music before sitting down in the living room. He felt slightly elated according to his appellate brief, but after a while, he went to the bathroom to check on the situation. According to his later testimony, he said, quote, I didn't really think they were dead, really. So I went back to see if they were dead, end quote. After contemplating the way ahead and changing into more suitable, not completely bloody clothes, Edward left the house and went to a bar and he spent the rest of the night getting wasted. After the bars closed, he got into his parked car, puked all over himself and passed out. Eventually, though, some police officers saw him passed out in the parked car. They knocked on the window and talked to him. But instead of taking him in, they took his keys instead. A few hours later on June 10th, when he woke up from his drunk stupor in his car, Edward realized he didn't have keys. So he walked home, broke into the house, changed and got ready for work. He then drove his wife's car back to where his car was parked overnight at the bar. He left his wife's car and drove his car to work. He was at work for a few hours. It was a Friday, I believe, before bouncing out early at 2 p.m. He didn't tell anybody where he was going. He went to the Compass Bank, took out $300, then got a $5,000 loan against his credit card. Edward then decided he didn't want to face the consequences for his family's murder. That Saturday, Edward went to a local dealership where he sold one of his cars for $3,500. He got a check for it and never cashed it. 
The dealership then dropped him off at the Orlando International Airport, where he boarded a plane to Hawaii. He was on his way to make a new life for himself. It was on Monday, June 13th, that the Ukaloosa County Sheriff's Office conducted a welfare check on the family after Edward failed to show up for work. But when the sheriff arrived at the home, two Air Force sergeants were waiting for them. They were extremely concerned because the house had a broken window and some bent screens. The sheriff thought it was odd, and after knocking on the window, knocking on the doors, ringing the doorbell, and attempting entry through the doors, the sheriff jumped in through the broken window, which led into the laundry room. And once in, he knew something terrible had happened because there was blood splatter everywhere. And that's when he entered the bathroom to see something out of a horror movie. 75% of the Zack family was dead and the father was nowhere to be found. A manhunt soon ensued, extending not only throughout the local area, but back in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where Edward called home. But they were all looking in the wrong places. Somehow, while everyone was searching for Edward in Florida and Michigan, Edward found himself in Molokai, Hawaii. A quick Google search of Molokai revealed that it's Hawaii's fifth largest island, and is only 38 miles long by 10 miles wide. It is home to the world's highest sea cliff and the longest continuous fringing reef. And according to a Visit Hawaii website, Molokai isn't for everyone, especially not for tourists. So how Edward found himself in this kind of remote area in 1984 is beyond me. But apparently he had heard that it was a place where many drifters wound up. According to Edward Tanji with the Honolulu Advertiser, While Edward was in Molokai, he was taken in by a local pastor and his wife. Cappy Caparita and Judy Caparita had been pastoring the Pentecostal Gospel Shoes Church in Walua for five years. It's unclear to me if they found him wandering the streets or if Edward just happened upon their church, but they made a connection. Edward lied to them and told them that his name was Michael Green. He said that his mom died when he was only three years old and that he lived with his grandmother until recently when she died. They saw he was in need and he agreed to work odd jobs around the church in exchange for a place to call home. And they let him stay in this little shed on their property. And the arrangement seemed to work for both parties. Edward didn't stir up any trouble and he just kind of laid low. That is until Friday night, October 14th, 1994, when the Caparitas sat down to watch television, which was a rare event around the Caparita home. But on this particular night, they had guests over, including Edward. When they turned on the TV, Unsolved Mysteries was on. And I know that my true crime army loves Unsolved Mysteries. Well, what do you know? They aired the story about the Eglin Air Force Base triple murder. And right there on the screen was Edward's picture. I imagine the words, have you seen this guy, were sprawled in large letters. Edward was probably trying not to sweat or act nervous as the family watched on. But the resemblance was uncanny. When Cappy turned to Edward and said, he sure does look like you. And Edward just laughed it off like, ha <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's not me. Cappy had a feeling it really was Edward, but he didn't say anything else that night, particularly because he had other guests. And he really didn't fear for his family, is what he told the newspapers later. The next morning, when the Caparitas went to wake Edward, they found that he was gone. But he left a note. The note read, quote, You showed me love and that Jesus Christ covered the multitude of sins and evil I have in my heart, end quote. Edward apologized for lying about who he really was, but after spending four months with them, he felt that he had enough courage to face the consequences. By that point, Edward had stopped running and he turned himself in to the Maui police. That morning, Edward was in a Maui court facing an extradition hearing back to Florida. It was later discovered that on two separate occasions, Edward told a female neighbor that if Sylvia ever asked him for a divorce, he would kill her and the family. What the what? I mean, what do you say to someone who tells you that? Do you laugh it off? Do you tell their spouse? The woman rightfully looked at him and was like, you know, if you kill your family, you're going to go to jail. 
And then you're not going to be able to hug them or hold them or anything like that. To which Edward responded with a nod. After turning himself in, Edward pled guilty to all three capital first degree murder charges. Maybe he thought by pleading guilty, someone would have mercy on his sorry ass. He cried a lot on the stand. And when asked why he used a machete of all weapons, he said, quote, because my understanding is if you sever the spine, the person dies instantly without any pain, end quote. I found it odd that during his testimony, Edward admitted that prior to murdering his wife, he attempted to get an additional $200,000 life insurance policy on her life. His intent was for a murder-suicide, to kill his wife and then to kill himself. And he felt that the kids would be well off with that extra life insurance money. But eventually, he didn't go through with the increased insurance because he didn't want his wife to ask any questions. And I don't really know why he ended up killing his kids if he really just hated his wife. But the prosecutors had no intention of letting up on the death penalty. They had seen the brutality of the pictures and they had seen firsthand the callousness of a man who was too coward to stick around for the consequences. So they went full steam ahead. In death penalty cases, as I have discussed on other occasions, the prosecutors typically have to prove murder plus. Just proving that someone murdered someone isn't enough. And in this case, according to the appellate opinion, the prosecutors introduced three aggravating factors. First, they had to prove that he committed prior capital offenses, three murders all at once, albeit they were all simultaneous. Second, they had to prove that the murders were committed in a cold, calculated and premeditated manner. And third, that the murders were committed in an especially heinous, atrocious or cruel manner. Edward argued, yeah, okay, whatever. But what about my clean criminal history? Come on, man, that must count for something. (laughs) He also argued that at the time of the murders, he was suffering extreme mental anguish. In addition to those two mitigating factors, he submitted to the court two dozen, two dozen, that's 24 other mitigating factors. And I'm just going to name a few here because some of them are kind of ridiculous. First, he said, yeah, but I turned myself in. He also talked about how he pled guilty, how he was a hard worker how he was on the dean's list in college. He was a stellar airman in the Air Force. He talked about how he was remorseful and wait for it. He said he was a loving father and husband until the offense. Wait, what? I mean, okay, if I was his lawyer, I would have been like, yeah, no, you know, let's let's leave that part out. I don't think they're going to like that. But anyway, they used it anyway. Another thing that he did was he blamed it on his wife, claiming that he was the passive one in the marriage dominated by his wife. He argued that he was raised in a house without his dad. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So did half the country, buddy. He talked about how he wasn't religious before the incident, but he has since found God. He argued how well behaved he was while he was a fugitive from the law. And in addition to about a dozen more, he ended his mitigating factors with, yeah, yeah but at least I'm not a psychopath. (laughs) All right, that last one, the judge was like, no, we're not gonna consider that. That's not a real thing. The jury considered the evidence and probably forever traumatized after seeing those crime scene pictures that they were like, you know what, Edward? We're recommending that you serve two death sentences for your wife and your son and that you serve life for your daughter's death. And the reason why they went with life versus death for the daughter was because It was unclear if the daughter knew that she was about to be murdered, whereas the wife knew because he had tried to kill her so many times and the son definitely knew because he saw in the mirror, according to Edward. The crazy part in this case is that the jury's sentence recommendation is just that, a recommendation. And the judge is the one who ultimately makes a decision. The judge has the power for a jury override. Well, the death penalty votes were not unanimous in this case. In fact, Edward was very close to convincing the jury against the death penalty. But ultimately, the jury voted seven to five for the death penalty for the murder of Sylvia and little Edward. Circuit Judge G. Robert Barron considered the evidence and the recommendation and was like, got it. But Edward, I am sentencing you to three death sentences. 
on appeal, Edward made some outrageous allegations, something similar to heat of passion, that he was outraged by the news of the impending divorce and he didn't have a cool down period. But wait, Edward also tried to pull the, quote, middle class murder exception to the death penalty card. Wait, what? Okay, listen up. As I was reading the appellate court's footnote, because this was only a footnote, I was taken aback by this. Apparently, there is an argument, the middle class murder exception. It's an argument that when something like this, the death penalty is not given in cases where, quote, the defendant, a respectable citizen, succumbs to the horrible explosion of total criminality that sometimes overcomes fundamentally decent people, end quote. I'm not, what? The middle class murder exception? I'm not even sure if this is a real thing. I mean, it is apparently because there's some cases that he he quoted. And honestly, I was a little bit confused if what the heck. But the judge was like, no, no, I'm not going to that. No, you're not going to be able to use that in in here. You're not going to be able to use that here. But there you have it, folks. At one point or maybe I don't know, Florida law. But uh, apparently at one point there was a middle class murder exception or something like that. Well, the judge considered the heat of passion like evidence and he was like, wait a minute, buddy. You found out about this in the morning when your son called you. You bought the murder weapon at lunch. You went back to work to finish your day's work with the military and everyone said you were acting normal. Then you went to class. You had a beer. Then you went home and waited for everyone to arrive. And then you picked them off one by one. And you mean to tell me you didn't have a moment to collect your thoughts? Mm, mm, I'm not buying it. Yeah, no, thanks for playing. Edward further argued that he killed his family to save them from the trauma of a divorce. Again, the judge was probably rolling his eyes and said, nope, murder is worse than divorce. Or maybe the appellate judge even said my true crime army life rule, which is divorce is better than murder. Well, it's not surprising that the appellate court upheld Edward's three death sentences. But the legal wranglings were not yet over because in 2003, the Florida Supreme Court considered Edwards' case again. This time, he argued ineffective assistance of counsel. He argued that his guilty plea was improvident and should be set aside and that the death penalty was unconstitutional. But the court upheld the decision. And today, over 25 years after the annihilation of his family, Edward still sits on death row awaiting execution. The state of Florida law is fluctuating with regards to whether the jury must be unanimous in recommending the death sentence. But in any event, once I hear about this case and whether he's actually ever executed or any other arguments that he comes up with, I will be sure to let you all know. So make sure that you're following me on social. I wanted to leave you all today with some information that I found interesting about family annihilators. I mean, murder never makes sense, but family annihilations really never make sense to me. And I've even read about some family annihilators who not only kill their families, but they kill the family pets too. Like, no kidding, they want to get rid of everyone. I found an article by Jordan Fenster in the CT Post And the article discusses the psychology behind family annihilators. N.G. Barrel is a forensic psychologist and director of the New York Forensic, which is a private consulting group. And he told the CT Post that there are three types of family annihilators. The first is a person who is suffering from psychosis. This includes someone who believes that there's an imaginary event that is going to occur and the killer sees himself as sparing the family from this catastrophe. The second type of family annihilator is a person who is under a lot of financial strain. Apparently, statistics show that about 25 to 30% of family annihilators have significant debt. They kill their family to keep them from the humiliation of hitting rock bottom. For example, getting evicted or having to show the world that they are really not as well off as they seem. Now, I'm not sure if this is more or less now because of social media and keeping up with the Joneses, but this is one of the types of family annihilators. And the third and final type of family annihilator 
is a person who just wants to get out of their family life obligations. They want to be free and the only way they see to do that is to get rid of the impediment, which in their eyes is the entire family unit. All right, apparently 95% of family annihilators are men. So there you have it. Those are the three types of family annihilators, at least as I saw in that one post. All right. As you watch the news and you hear about other family annihilators, you'll see that they truly do fit into one of these three categories. True Crime Army, this case just further shows that the number one True Crime Army rule is still alive and well. Imagine the life that Edward, Sylvia, and their two kids could have lived had Edward just allowed his wife to walk away from their marriage. It's just super frustrating. All right, I want to thank Falcon 13 for recommending this case. I had vaguely heard about it, but digging into the appellate filings and the subsequent court opinions was truly fascinating for me. Thank you, Falcon 13, and to my other listeners who are always recommending fascinating cases. All righty, I want to make sure that you are all following me on social, on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, and make sure that you join the Facebook discussion group at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. All right. Shout out to the newest dotted line members of the fan club, Claire K, Cherish B and Savannah F. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. This month's newest associate producer is Erica J. And shout out to my executive producer, Falcon 13. And as always, the music was created by Ty Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work another podcast.